as, as people hop on and we start, uh, start our class off in prayer, I want to show you guys. So I'm going through, uh, going to go through a little book tonight called uh, Partners in Discipleship. And many of you have taken this class. Uh, the material's been put out. Uh, D. James Kennedy in the early 70s uh, came out with a program for evangelism called Evangelism Explosion. And uh, it is a, uh, just a whimsical way to share your faith with people. So uh, this program has been spread to every country in the world. And so here at Faith Community Church, uh, we actually teach people how to share their faith in a whimsical way. And I see, you know, some of you guys that are on here tonight uh, uh, have actually been through that class. So this material uh, takes us to the step that I believe Jesus wants us to go to, right? To go and to make disciples. And so this is a discipleship curriculum that goes through um, the, just the tenets of the faith, the things that we really need to, go, uh, to know, and it needs to begin where it begins. It begins with Christ. So we need to begin with Christ, and that's what we're going to do tonight uh, as, we, uh, as we go through this material. Uh, we're going to find out who Christ is, because I think you guys would agree. Give me a, give me a show of hands on here uh, how many people agree with this. Uh, we have to understand who Christ is in order to have a uh, salvific relationship with him. Would you guys agree with that? And, uh, and as far as uh, timing on this, I just want to make a note before we pray. Uh, Brett's done a fantastic job, and Andy, they've got this down now. I think we're only just a few seconds behind. So what, uh, what you're seeing, I'm seeing just in a few seconds. So we're doing good, Brett? Awesome. All right, guys. So... Um, Welcome, welcome. All right, Jane, I see you there. Good. All right, so let's begin. And you guys, one more thing. Get your Bibles out uh, because we're going to be reading some scripture together. I have a number of questions for you. We're going to be looking up scripture passages and we're actually going to uh, be asking some questions and I'll need you guys to answer. So, and I'm going to wait for your answers and then we'll reveal them to you. So we're going we're gonna to do that. We'll open in prayer uh, and then we'll do that. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we just, uh, we stand before you, Lord. We're humbled to be in your presence. Thank you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to, to gather, to study your word. Uh, we just, um, Lord, we thank you for just how amazing you are, Lord. And just be with our country. Just be with uh, our families during this time, during this pandemic. I just lift up our leaders to you. I pray for the, that they would have wisdom and how to lead. Lord, that you would give them um, the right motives, stir them to, uh, to a relationship with you. And just bless each and every one that's on tonight. Pray for protection for everybody. And uh, for those, uh, Lord, that have caught this virus, we just pray, Lord, that for their uh, speedy recovery. And all things, Lord, we ask for your will to be done. As we dig in this evening into the study of your word, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its accuracy, Lord, that it's without error. We thank you that there's only one interpretation, that you don't intend to be thousands of different interpretations, but only one. And Lord, I pray tonight that we would find the meaning in context of uh, what you'd have us to learn tonight about you, about Jesus, about Christ, about the Messiah. And uh, Lord, just bless this time and, uh, and all that we do, uh, we seek to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. We're going to start our first question. If you bring that up, Andy, our first question, we're going to look in uh, Romans chapter 5. And we're going to ask a question, we're going to read it, and I'll read uh, the verse. And then uh, I need you guys to respond. So I, again, I have my phone here, so I, I'm on the, the, uh, the YouTube stream, so I'm on my, on my phone here. I can see, oh, there's Jamie, good to see you. I see you're on. Uh, Go ahead and just respond with the, the answer. Just type it in, and, and then I'll, we'll look at a few of those. Uh, and then Andy's going to reveal the answer uh, to the question. So, according to Romans 5, verse 8, how has God shown that he loves you? Let's look at what Romans 5, 8 says. And uh, so, if you have your Bibles, that's good. Turn over to them. If all you have is your phone and you're, you're locked into YouTube, that's fine, too, because I'm going to read it. So, we'll look at Romans 5, 8. It says... But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So according to Romans 5, 8, how has God shown that he loves you? 
And if nobody responds, this is going to be a very, very long night. <laughs> or it's going to be short. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. How has God shown that he loves you? All right. Gilbert says Christ dying for us. That's it. That's it. Go ahead. Let's, let's see what the answer is. How, how has he shown that he loved us? Because Christ died for my sins. That's love. That's love right there. So that's what Romans 5, 8 says, Christ died for our sins. Let's, let's look. That's perfect. Jane, great, great answer. He died for us. Absolutely. Let's look at uh, the next question. We're going to go over to uh, Romans uh, 6, 23. And uh, we're going to look in Romans 6, 23, and we're going to see what it is that, uh, what is the result of sin? So Christ died for us. We're going to see what that result of sin is in Romans 6, 23. So let's read that. It says this. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the translation I'm reading is the New American Standard, and, and it's because the material that I'm looking at here, it's actually uh, fantastic. They've actually put, made it all compact. They've actually put the verses here on the inside of the column, uh, so you can do this study to stand alone with just this book, even for like a new Christian maybe who doesn't have a Bible yet. Uh, so they are working on um, a brand new version of this book, probably in the ESV, and uh, that should be out real soon. But So if my translation sounds a little different than yours, uh, that's okay. We're good. We're good. Uh, so what's the result of sin? Eternal life. Yes, yes, eternal life. Uh, but what's the result of sin? Uh, we're getting, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But the result of sin is death Gilbert says, death, but Christ offered us eternal life through him. So you guys are, you guys are reading, reading ahead here. That's perfect. It is death. It is death. Um, that's a result of sin. So uh, the ne second part of this is what does Jesus Christ offer? And we're seeing that, right? He offers us eternal life. And, and that eternal life, as we know, is now and forever. It starts now and goes on forever. So that's what Christ um, has done for us. That's good, that's good. All right, let's look at, um, that's good, Gilbert, perfect. Everlasting life, exactly. Let's look at question number three. And that says, uh, it says this. If eternal life is a free gift, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, do you have to work for it? Well, let's look and see what Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast. So do we have to work for it, this free gift? This is one of the more obvious answers here, so hopefully you guys get this. I think we're on track. You know, and another thing, we... Um, a lot of times, I, for me, I've had a relationship with God since I was five, almost six years old. So just had a birthday. I can't do the math. It's been 30, 40 years, 42 years, 42 years. Okay. But going back and looking at this material, I have found, and even teaching this material, I found it to be very encouraging to me uh, to get back. Just, you know, we think simple things, right? It's simple. The gospel is easy to understand. The, the issues we're going to talk about tonight, about who Christ is, these are not um, super complex uh, issues that are going to uh, confound you as a Christian. Um, and so, you know, so I'm not trying to trick you in any way about this. So I got a text as well, uh, which I can't skip over to right now. Uh, so yes, yes, no works. That's right. That's right. No, it wouldn't be free if we had to work for it. That's right, Gilbert. It wouldn't be free. Uh, Jane says the same thing. It's a free gift of grace. That's right. If, if we had to do something to earn it, it wouldn't be grace, would it? So that's important that it's free. And then how do we get it? That's the second part of this. How do, how do we get, if you go ahead, Andy, reveal that answer. Um, how do we get it? Hold off on that one. How do we get it? We get it by faith. Absolutely. Absolutely, Gilbert. We get it through faith. And we get it through faith in Christ alone. So that's the key. 
is where are we putting our faith for our eternal life? Are we depending on ourselves? Are we depending on our membership in a church? Are we depending on our, our baptism, maybe as a child or maybe as an adult or maybe both? Um, it's, it's through faith that we have that relationship. And even that faith that we have is an alien faith. It's foreign to us. God gives us that faith, right? For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That is, the faith is not of us. The faith is of Jesus. He gives us his faith. And then we turn, and we're going to find out how, right? But we turn in repentance, and we put our faith and trust, the faith he gives us, we put our trust in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. So that's fantastic. That's a great verse. It's a great verse. Uh, memorize these verses, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Great verses. Uh, so Gilbert says, I used to put my faith in my good works. Yeah, exactly, brother. I mean, that, what did that get you? Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe it got you a false sense of hope. Maybe it didn't give you any hope at all, right? Because our good works, we see, are just filthy rags. Right? We, we see that in Isaiah. Um, yeah, we can do, do good things for people till we're blue in the face. And I'm not saying that's bad, right? It's good to do good works for people. But truly good works we see come from the Holy Spirit, come from a relationship that we have in Jesus. Um, so that's important. Let's put our, our faith in Jesus alone, not, not leaning on anything else. So let's look at uh, question number four now. We'll move on to that one. And we're going to read uh, Romans uh, 10, 9 to 10, and 13. And we're going to answer this question. As, as, as I read this, be thinking about the answer and, and get ready and start mashing it in on your keyboard. What did Jesus do for you? Romans 10, 9 to 10 and 13. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So what did Jesus do for you? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. What do you guys think? It's a little bit longer answer on this one. I'll give you a couple more seconds. He's, he saved me, exactly. And, and not just that, Gilbert, right? He saved me. A little bit longer from that, Andy, if you want to show this answer here. Yes, exactly, exactly, Jane. He died and rose again to save us, exactly. So he rose from the dead. So you look, look at other religions who all their prophets have died, right? They're dead. They're, they're worm bait, right? Jesus conquered sin and death, right? And then that, so that gives him a unique ability then to give us eternal life everyone else is dead he he showed he could conquer sin and death by rising from the grave so and he did that to save me and to save you uh, the second part of that is um, what does he require you to do so i kind of gave this out um, uh, rosalind says jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead she, she sent me a text that's right rosalind exactly exactly so andy if you want to reveal this next answer what, is that, what does he require you to do? Uh, I kind of gave the answer out, like I said. We, he requires you to confess him as Lord with my mouth. Believe, that means to put your trust in him as Savior in my heart and call upon his name in prayer. That's what he requires you to do. That's it. Gilbert, perfect. Great answer. Great answer, guys. Okay. Uh, the next part of this says, uh, Andy, if you want to change slides, um, have you done that? There's, uh, there's two answers here. Yes or no, and you can reveal those. Uh, no tricks. There's either a, uh, there's, there's no answer of, well, not yet, or I'm working on it, or I'm thinking about it. Maybe one day there's either a yes or there's a no. It's a binary system. 
God says you're either for me or you're against me. You're either a child of God or you're a child of Satan. Okay, this is, this is, what, the, this is what God's word says. So um, with, all, with our hearts, we believe and confess with our mouth. That's right, Jane, exactly. Uh, Gilbert says, yeah, over 20 years ago. That's perfect. That's perfect. Like I shared, for me, it's been, uh, it's been 42 years. Uh, I had a birthday this last weekend, so tick that off. 42 years. And uh, uh, it's been fantastic. God's delivered me from the fear of death, something I, I struggled with as a child. And um, I see a lot. I'm getting some texts. Yes, Rosalind says yes. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, that's, all, that's awesome. If you haven't, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Um, today's the day to start your relationship with Jesus. And, and I would encourage you to do that. And if you have questions about, about that, um, when we're done, call me, text me. Um, reach out to the church, and we're here to answer those for you as best we can. So have you done that, yes or no? If so, what has he done for you? What's he done for you? What's, the, what's, the Romans, uh, what's Romans 10 say that he's done for me? Yep, gave you a new heart. Gilbert says, a new mind, and especially forgave me of all my sins. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. And then, and that's, that's salvation. He saved me. That's what he's done for you. Say that, right? If, if I've done this, then he saved me. And uh, that's a blessing right there. So what's it mean? That's what I want to find out. So what's that mean? Uh, what in your understanding, that's the next question, what in your understanding does that mean? Hopefully we're keeping up online. You guys are hopefully tracking okay. Um, Tina says he's given me a purpose and a peace as well. Exactly. That's awesome. No, for sure, Tina. Absolutely. Um, but what else? What's, it, what's that mean that he saved me? We say that, right, as Christians? We'll, we, maybe even flippantly, right? Well, yeah, I, I've been saved. Have you been saved? And, and for people who don't know who God is and, and a modern culture who cannot tell you accurately who Jesus Christ is, when you say, I've been saved, have you been saved? People might just be scratching their heads. And so we throw around um, this sort of Christianese sometimes and uh, it makes it difficult, I think, when we speak. It's, it's, many times it's like a foreign language to people. So we try, to, we try to boil it down in this discipleship material to words that, you know, we understand that haven't been repurposed or recaptured by somebody else to mean something else, and uh, try to be very clear on that. So uh, Jane, Jane says, it's, I, I'll live eternally with God and Jesus. Yes, that's what it means. Gilbert says, he saved me from the wrath to come. That's right. So he's, Gilbert, you're talking about hell, the, the eternal destiny for all those who are apart from Christ, who don't have a relationship with God. And uh, so, um, remind you of Pilgrim's Progress, yes. Yep. Yep. So, what it means, what, what the understanding for me, what it means, based on what this verse says, it says, I've been rescued from a, the eternal punishment that was in hell under eternal life in heaven. So, if you've been saved, the question is, what have you been saved from? Well, as a Christian, you've been saved from hell. And, and then it begs the question, well, if I've been saved from hell, what have I been saved to? Well, as a Christian, you've been saved to eternal life. Uh, like Jane said, living eternally with God and Jesus. So that's right there an incredible blessing as well. Okay, let's, and normally I'd pause and say any questions and I'll look around. Any questions? The chairs are silent. I don't think the chairs are going to speak out, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on tonight. Question number five. Let's look at that. Andy will pull that up. All right. So it says, if to the best of your knowledge you have truly trusted Jesus Christ, then what, according to John 10, 10, B, and verse 28, does he promise you? Let's look at John 10, 10, and the, the latter part of that verse in verse 28. It says this, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. So to the, if to the best of your knowledge you've truly trusted Jesus Christ, then what, are you just, what we just read in these verses, 
What's Jesus promised to you? A new Maserati. No, that's not what it was. An abundant life. Wait, wait, are you guys looking on the... Oh, you just, okay, Brett's got it, he's got it. This is good. He didn't, he didn't cheat here, folks. This is, this is legit. We're, we're above, above, above board here. Uh, abundant life. Yes, abundant life. What else, though? Come on, there's more than just abundant. There's more than just an abundance. And abundance, again, it's not the new Maserati, necessarily. Uh, uh, okay, Jane says, I will not perish, and I cannot be snatched by the devil. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, where our life is eternal. It's now and forever. Eternal life doesn't start when we die as Christians. Eternal life starts when you repent, put your faith and trust in Jesus alone. You have that eternal life now and forever. And that's, that's amazing too, that God's done that. Um, it gets a little better when we die and we're in heaven and we're in glory and we're in the presence of Christ. Uh, I say a little better, probably a whole lot better, right, based on what God's word says. So that's great. Uh, and so the end of that, the last part of this question here is, is once you have that gift, can anyone take it from you? And, and Jane already answered that. I cannot be, it cannot be snatched by the devil, exactly. Gilbert, what? <laughs> love you, brother. No, that's good. You got me. That's good. That's good. Uh, and Rosalind says no. Nope, it cannot. Can't be taken away. You got it? Once, once saved, always saved. Um, there's, no, there's no losing your salvation. There's no, uh, I was a child of God, now I'm not. So we don't have to worry about that, um, which is a blessing. Now, I'm not saying that some people, some Christians do actually struggle with that assurance of salvation, as, as it's called. And, and, and this struggle is real. And I'll give you that. Struggle is real. And, but God's word is very clear, too, that, uh, that we do have life forever. It, it's not something we comes and goes. Okay. I need sanitize. All right. What are some of the ways that the devil can try to snatch us? That's a, that's a good question. That's a great question, Gilbert. What are some of, the, some of the ways the devil can try to snatch us? Boy, there's temptation after temptation after temptation out there. I mean, he pouring in your ear that you don't even have eternal life. I don't even know if you're a child of God, right? You sin, I sin, and next thing I hear, right, man, if you love God, would you really do that? So, right, there's lots of different ways the devil can, devil can tempt us like that and, uh, and mess with us. COVID-19, yeah, that's, that's messy, right? This, this really is a, is a test as well. Um, good, good stuff, guys. Good stuff. Let's look at question number six. Question number six says this. It says, if you have received Jesus Christ into your life and are trusting him alone as your Savior, what have you become according to John 1, 12 to 13? Okay, let's look at what John 1, 12 to 13 says. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, so how do we answer this one? If you're trusting in him alone, what have you become? Jane says, uh, children of God, God's chosen. Rosalind uh, texts it, she says, a child of God. Mm-hmm, hmm that's right, that's right. Uh, number six, the answer there, is what, Andy, if you'll reveal that. Not just a child of God, but how do we become a child? We become a child by adoption. So we're an adopted child of God, which means we're a member of his family. With all the rights and elsewhere, right? We're co-heirs with Jesus in God's family. That's amazing. And adoption, that's a, the, the neat thing about adoption. I like this. Um, 
think about how we do adoption uh, here in the world. Uh, the child doesn't go and find the parents and move into the house. The parents go and they seek out the children and bring them into their house. So this says a little something theologically, and, and the Jews of this time, they knew what adoption was, right? When you're adopted, the parents have found you and invited you in, and, and God has not just done that, but he's given you the share, a co-heir with Christ in glory. So that's amazing. Let's look at question number, yeah, Gilbert, that's right, it's amazing. Um, he gave us the right to become his child. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Let's look at uh, question number seven next. What does 2 Corinthians 2 or 5, 17 say takes place when a person trusts Christ and becomes a Christian? So 2 Corinthians 5, 17, what's it say when a person trusts Christ and becomes a Christian? So we'll look at that. If you guys have your Bibles, turn over. Um, if not, just follow along here. This is what it says. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So, what takes place in a person that trusts Christ and becomes a Christian? What's God's word say happens? Oh, and I'll answer that, Gilbert. Yes, he says a lot of unbelievers believe that they're children of God. In fact, I was thinking about this on the way over tonight because I've heard people say this. I see it on Facebook. Is We're all God's children. That just isn't theologically sound. We, we can't all be God's children uh, because we aren't all co-heirs with Christ because there is a hell. There is a place for people who are not God's children. So we're all brothers, uh, not all brothers, but we're all neighbors. Right? So we're to love our neighbors ourselves. So uh, Rosalind texted, yep, I'm a new creature. Um, same thing from Jane. I'm a new creature. You're born again. That's right. Uh, so let's look at uh, that answer. Let's look at that answer. The Bible says we're children of the devil. That's right. No, that's right, Gilbert. Um, we're children of the devil when we're apart from God. The answer to this question, when a person trusts Christ and becomes a Christian, uh, he becomes that's me, right? Or you. You become a new creature. That means there's a spiritual union with Christ and his or her life is changed. Think about that for a second. His or her life is changed. So there are no secret Christians. There's no people that can go around in society and you knew them for 30 years, say, and they're Christians, Christians, and you don't see anything different. You don't see anything different in their life. And they're, maybe you're, they're your family members. Nothing's changed. They still do what they used to do the same way they used to do it. I look at these verses and something has to change. Old things have passed away. All things, all things New things have come. So we have new life in Christ. And so that's, that's quite a bit, that's a big change. It's a big change. Um, we go from being children of the devil to being children of God. All right, let's look at the next, uh, the next one. This is going to be a little bit of uh, check marks for you, okay? So as we go through this, we're going to answer a couple of questions here on number seven. Uh, which of the following have you experienced? And you can type, the, I'd like you guys to type this in. If you, if you would, you can just say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? There's A through, a through H. Which of the following have you ex experienced? So just shout it out in the text here uh, uh, on our YouTube stream. Ready? Uh, a, have you experienced new joy from forgiveness? B, change in my attitudes. Maybe that's something you've experienced. C, New peace in my heart. D, a sense of belonging to God's family. How about E, a desire to read his word. F, new concern or love for others. 
Hmm. Uh, G, a new awareness of sin. Or, or even H, victory over sin. So Scott, Scott Garrell says A and C. Sonia says A and H. Scott's giving me more. He says G. Rosalind says A and H. Um, Matt, A, B, C, and D. Tina, all of them. Uh, Gilbert, all of them. Um, I've got, uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly, that's good. That's good. Yeah, praise God. What a blessing, right? Sonia, A through H. She says them all. Got them all. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, uh, and God can do that. He can give you he can give you a desire to read his word, his word. Um, he can give you a joy unspeakable, right? Uh, a peace that passes all understanding, to quote scripture. That's what he gives us, right? And some he gives more than others, right? And to some he gives, uh, and, and I guess in a greater quantity, a joy. But uh, people need to see your joy if you're a Christian, right? Uh, if you're, I was listening to a Ligonier Ministries podcast this morning, and uh, Oh, I just slipped my mind who was, who was preaching this morning. Someone help me on here. Um, he's a British guy, and uh, he was talking about his, his 11-year-old uh, uh, child giving him a, a birthday card, and the birthday card was a picture of Eeyore, and it said basically, have a good day or not, <laughs> right? And so if we're, and it was a wake-up call to him, he said, uh, you know, um, are we Eeyores or not? So, Gilbert says, uh, this list, God, works in your Christian life. Mm-hmm. Let's look. I'm going to turn the page. And I don't know if we're going to get through all these. I have 17 questions uh, from here that we're going to look at. Alistair. No, not, so, uh, was it Alistair Beggs? No, I don't think it was him. I don't think it was him. Derek Thomas, yes, Matt, that's it. That's who it was. Great. If you guys don't have the Ligonier app, you aren't listening to the morning podcast, you're missing out. They're fantastic, good, solid, biblical, reformed teaching. Um, I love it. But Derek Thomas, yes, yeah, dear brother in the Lord. Okay, let's go on to question number eight. And it says this, it says this. According to 1 John 5, 11 to 13, how do you know that you have eternal life? Well, that's, that's an interesting one, right? Because we say, the Bible says we have it, but so if there's a question about how you know, then I want to know the answer. How do I know? How do I know that I have eternal life? How did I know when I was five years old and I was afraid of death and dying and being sent to hell? When my pastor, Bill Lloyd Jr., would preach about heaven, I got really excited. But when he preached about hell, I got really scared because I knew that was what, where I was going to end up. So... How do we know, and I knew when I started my relationship with God that night, that, that I was, and I, and I did have eternal life. I didn't have to worry about that anymore. So there's a way to know. Let's read what 1 John 5, 11 to 13 says. And it says this, And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. So the answer to the question, how do you know, how do you know that you know that you know that you have eternal life? I'll give you guys a minute to answer this one. Okay, Rosalind says eternal life is in Jesus, and I believe in Jesus. Excellent, excellent. Sonia says, he who, has, he who has the Son, not that we know Christ, but that he knows us. There's a relationship. Yes, he who has the Son has life. Yeah, there's a relationship there. Gilbert, by reading the Bible. Yeah, that's right. No, that's right. Um, and what we read from the Bible is... We have Jesus. Um, okay. Jane says, because I believe in Jesus Christ alone as my Savior. Mm -hmm. 
Let's look at that answer. That's, that's, that's right on. And it's almost word for word, because eternal life is in Jesus, and I believe in him, I trust in him as Savior in my heart. And we know that Christ alone as Savior is not his position, right? He's both Savior and Lord. But just looking at this verse here, it says we have eternal life if we believe, and because I believed in him as as Savior in my heart, I have eternal life. That's incredible too. It's incredible too. We have a relationship with God. Okay, all right. Let's look at question number nine. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, and answer this question. What is true then? What is true about the temptations that you face? Let's look at that. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says this. Let's try to answer the question from this verse. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. So what's true about the temptations you face? What's true about temptations that Christians face? Okay, I had a bit of a glitch there. Are you guys still with me? I'm doing good? Okay. I'm waiting for the replies to come in. What's true about temptations we face? Okay, Jane says, God will not let us be be tempted beyond what we can bear. That's interesting, right? Uh, As Derek Thomas was preaching today, he's been preaching through the book of Job. So again, if you're missing that, you're missing that. But... Job was allowed to be tempted by Satan, allowed to be put through a whole litany of things. If you've read Job, you know what I'm talking about. It's a mess. So if Job can endure the temptation that he endured, which is amazing that he could, that he could do that, and that not be more than he could bear, each person is different because I, I don't know if I could bear what he bear, bore. Right, guys? I mean, that's, that's tough. Very difficult. Um, Faith Community Church says, <laughs> the guys in the sound booth, it's true Christians are tempted, but Christ will help us overcome them. Yes, he'll help us overcome these temptations. Exactly. Um, but what's the true part? Um, Gilbert says, I'll never go a day without being tempted. Yeah. The true part is... Sonia says, um, she says, my temptations comes from my own heart. The enemy prompts me to act on them. Uh, And this is Sonia. She says, but through Christ and his spirit, he gives me the power to not act on them and walk in his ways instead. Absolutely. Praise God. Rosalind, they're common to us, but Christ is there to guide us. That's it. Exactly. If you want to show that answer. These temptations that we face, they're common to all Christians. They're common to all man, as Rosalind put it, right? Everyone, all Christians experience temptations. But we've said this and we've answered this in part already. What does God do to help? The second part of this. What does God do to help? Um, He keeps me, and if you want to show that answer, Andy, he keeps me from temptations that are beyond my ability to withstand, and he provides an escape route for me. You guys believe that? I believe that. I've seen that. I've seen that. And uh, and it takes it takes maturity um, as you and as you mature as a Christian to see that if you're prone to certain temptations, that there's ways that God provides escapes for that. Maybe um, you're a child and you like to steal bubble gum from the from the corner store, right? And it's easy, right? Because no one's watching. You think. And uh, the temptation is there. And um, 
God provides ways around that temptation. Maybe he reveals to you that, you know, it's not good for me to go alone in that store, or it's not good for me to go near the bubble gum because I have an issue with it. So maybe the way of escape is you just don't go down the bubble gum aisle, right? Maybe it's something simple like that. Maybe there's other ways. You know, we can get, get into uh, more complicated situations, but for the sake of time, we won't. But you guys know what I'm talking about if, you're, if you have a relationship with God. Uh, there's things you know where you're tempted, where I'm tempted, that you know that if that temptation comes up, it's very easy to fall into. But God has said he's not going to tempt us but beyond which we can handle or withstand. And he's going to give you an escape route. There's an escape route. There's a way out that we have. So that's, that's a blessing there to have. Exactly. No, Jane, you're right. I, I, I love that he provides an escape. Exactly. I love that he provides an escape. All right, let's look at number 10. And this one's going to be a fun one here. Uh, I love this. Uh, what, what, where does James 1, 13 to 14 say some temptation comes from? Let's look at James uh, chapter 1 in verses 13 to 14. It says this, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For he, for God, cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each of us is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. So where, according to James 1, 13 to 14, where does temptation come from? You know what I see and hear and read while you guys are chiming in where temptation comes from? All the time. You guys know what I'm going to say. Where, where's temptation come from? The devil. The devil made me do it. It was the devil. God, devil made me do it. Yeah, right. Does David says our sin nature. Yes. Yes, exactly. Rosalind, Rosalind said the same thing. Um. From the evil in your heart, Scott says. From the evil in your heart. Yep. It's not. It's not the devil, brothers and sisters. It's not the devil. I'm not saying the devil doesn't tempt us, right? In this case, is that what we're saying? The devil doesn't tempt us? Is he involved in the temptation? We're going to get to that in just a second about what the devil's doing to that temptation. But the source of the temptation... Source of the temptation, if you want to reveal that answer, Andy, comes from my own lust. Doesn't come from God. That's the source, the root, the sin nature that we have. And, and let's look at the, the next part of this. Uh, and, and we're going to go over to 1 Peter 5.8. We'll look at question number 11. And what's the devil trying to do to you through temptation? So he may bring a temptation, but where he may bring a test to us or a temptation to us or something that's going to trip us up. Our lust and our desire are what's going to be the source, what's going to make us give in to that temptation when we choose to give in. We have a choice now. This is different. We have a choice here. It comes from my own lust, but the devil's trying to do something by bringing that, that temptation to us. Rosalind says it, right? He's trying to destroy us. Let's see what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. It says this, Be of sober spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So what's the devil trying to do to you through your temptation? Like a roaring lion, he seeks to eat us up. That's right, Jane. Eat us up. He's trying to devour me. He doesn't want me to have what I have because he can't have what I have. He can't have what you have, dear Christian. He's jealous. And he wants us all to fail. He wants, us to, he wants to show to God, just like he did with Job, 
this guy, if you do this, if I can do this to him, if you, God, if you allow me to do this to him, oh, he's going to curse your name. He's going to hate you. And uh, to kill, to destroy, uh, to steal. Mm -hmm. That's what Sonia said. Let's look at uh, let's look at the next one. Let's go on. What number are we on now? Number twelve. Number twelve. What two things, according to Second Thessalonians three verse three, will God do for you at such times? So, what two things will God do for you at such times that you're tested, that you are tempted by the devil with the lust from your own heart, where 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 the temptation arises, and the devil just kind of pokes at that. Right, just kind of fuels that, just kind of fires that, puts a little prong in there and says, come on, come on, Jason, you can do this. Um, God will never know, right? My lust, right, brings me to that, uh, that sin. So what will God do, though? Let's see what 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says. It says this, 2 Th Thessalonians 3.3, 3, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So what are the two things? The two things. Sonia says he strengthens and protects us. Mm -hmm. That's right. Go ahead and show that answer, if you would. He strengthens and protects me from the devil. That's amazing. How we're not on our own. That's just it, right? That's the, the cool thing about the, the Christian life is we're not on our own, right? We have that spiritual union, that mysterious union with the Holy Spirit, with God, Right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We're joined. We're not alone. Ever. Ever alone. Uh, so that's something to hang on to as well. God says He's going to strengthen you. He's going to protect you from the devil. Amen. Amen to that. Number 13 says this. Here's the, here's the question we're going to ask. And we're going to look at three different Scripture verses to answer this question with kind of three different answers here. Okay? What three things should you do according to the following scriptures? What three things should you do according to the following scriptures? We're going to start with two verses in Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 9 and 13 first. Um, and it says this. I'm going to read Matthew 6, 9 and 13. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So what should we do here, according to the scriptures? When we talk about being tempted by the evil one, by sin, from the lust in our hearts, what are we supposed to do? Pray. Gilbert says pray. That's right. And we pray specifically for deliverance from evil. Pray in this way. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yep, that's right, Rosalind. Nailed it. Perfect. Pray to, and, and pray to the Lord in those times. Exactly. Exactly. We pray to the Lord. And uh, He'll deliver us from evil. Uh, and let's look at Psalms, the next one. Psalms 119. Uh, and we're going to look in verses 9 and 11. Psalms 119 and verses 9 and 11. It says this. So we reveal the answer. Okay, great. It says this. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. Thy word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Or I learned that thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So what do we do here according to these scriptures? What can we do to avoid these temptations or to get through these temptations? What's going to help us in this case from the book of Psalms? Gilbert says to hide God's word in your heart. What's that mean? What's that mean to hide God's word in your heart? I mean, that's what the, the verse says, right? Or treasure. To have, you know, the word of I treasure in my heart. 
Yeah, uh, uh, Jane says, living by God's word and learning it. Sonia says, it's like this, read the word of God, commit it to memory, and apply what God has revealed to us. Mm -hmm. Read it, commit it to memory, and then apply it. Uh, fill our hearts with God's word and scripture. That's what Rosalind says. Uh, and and um, Rosalind said, oh, she just followed up with that. Mm -hmm. Gilbert says meditating or memorizing, meditating and applying. Yes, you have to have all three. It's great. And actually, I'm, I'm reading through the Psalms. I've been reading through them for uh, over a month now. And, and I'm finding the same thing. If I... Uh, and Angela says this, memorize and know God's word. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it, when, when, when you're reading through the Psalms and, or, or any of, of Scripture and you're, you're putting it into your heart and memorizing it, I promise you, God's word promises you. That's not just my promise. I, I, God's word backs this up. When, the, when you've treasured his word, you won't sin against him. And that's the thing, when we read God's Word, we read it over and over again, because really, to understand the mind and heart of God, to understand who Christ is, to understand who we are, how do we have that relationship, when you really understand God, you are not going to want to sin against Him. I'm not going to want to sin against Him. So if I'm still sinning, I don't quite understand God. I don't understand that he's provided a way of escape from these temptations. I don't understand that he's going to protect and deliver me. I don't understand maybe that I can pray for his protection. I don't understand that temptation doesn't come from God. I don't understand that the, the devil made me do it. I, I'm confused, right? Read God's word, folks. Read God's word, brothers and sisters. And know um, that when you have it treasured up, you will not sin against God. So that's good stuff. All right, see anyone else come in? Mine kind of freaked out on me. Oh, okay, so Angela Grell says, this is how Jesus resisted Satan three times after fasting 40 days. That's right, exactly, Angela. You think he knew God's word? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Let's look now. Let's see. Do we, oh, we, got, we have a few more minutes. We have a few more minutes. I'm running out of time, but let's do this. Let's look at number 14. And before I do, uh, I want to read what, what Jane just said in, in Psalms 119.37. It says, Turn my eyes away from, the worthless, from worthless things. Renew my life according to your word. Ooh, ouch. Ouch and amen. Right? I think with this whole pandemic, we've all found new ways to recreate worthless things. <laughs> so we need to uh, renew our lives according to his word. Exactly. We need to get in God's word and study. Do that. If you're, not, if you're not reading the Bible every day, I would encourage you to do that. If you're reading the Bible every day, I'd encourage you to do that. Get in. Get in and study. Uh, number four, or no, we're on James. James 4, 7. It says this. It says... Um, Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Okay? So what are we, what's our takeaway here? What are we supposed to do? It's right there in the verse. We submit to God, and we resist the devil. So there's something we have to do. This isn't passive Christianity where we sit back and just wait for God to deliver us and carry us, carry us on a chariot up to heaven, okay? These are action verbs here. I think they're verbs. I wasn't very good in English, but I'm going to say submit's a verb and resist is a verb. You guys with me on that in the back? That good? Okay. So we're submitting, we're resisting, we're doing that. That's right. That's right. Jane, Gilbert, exactly. You guys got it. Submit and resist. Number 14. It's, and here's the question we're going to ask here. And this comes from 1 John 1, verse 9. It says, if you fail and sin, what should you do? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. So if we fail in sin, what should we do? Continue to sin? Shrug it off and say, eh, eh, I'm just human. I mean, God doesn't expect me to be perfect, right? I just, you know, I can't, I can't be perfect. Uh, Sonia says to humble ourselves before God and submit to him, resist temptations from the devil, the world and our hearts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Rosalind says to confess my sin. Confess my sins to God. Yes. Scott, Bishop, ask for forgiveness. Confess and repent, Matt says. Confess our sins, uh, Jane says. Exactly. Exactly. So we, can, we confess, my, confess my sins to God. That's what I'm called to do. And here's the other part of it. What will God do? What will God do when we confess our sins? What has he promised? This is a promise. What has he promised he's going to do if we confess our sins to him? Oh, Sonia says to run to God, not away from him. Confess our sins and trust he forgives us. Yes, Jane, he forgives us and he purifies us. Rosalind says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So we have a promise that he will faithfully, righteously forgive me. Cleanse me from all my sins. That's what he promises. That's what God promises he'll do. If then, if we confess, then God will forgive. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Let's look at number 15. What else should you do? Besides, besides this, if we fall into sin, what else should we do? There's two things. We're going to look at a, a verse in Proverbs in 28.13 and then another one in Ephesians 4. Proverbs 28.13 uh, says this, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. What, do, what else should we do if we sin? Gilbert's thanking God for that, that he forgives us. Yes, brother. Yeah, praise God for that. What else do we need to do, though? It's not, it's not enough. There's something else. Confess and renounce. Gilbert says forsake. That's right, Jane. Confess and renounce. We, we stop it. We said this isn't it. That's not what I'm doing. That's not me. That's just, this sin does not define me. I'm going to forsake it. I'm going to quit doing it. I'm done. And we have to make that decision. Rosalind says forsake. Sonia, renounce, then turn away from them. Mm -hmm. So if we're in sin, we renounce it. We say, I'm not, I am not this person. I am not going to be tempted in this way. God's forgiven me of that sin. I've repented and confessed my sins to him. He's forgiven me of it. I'm now going to turn away from that. That's repentance. Turn away from my sins. That's 180 degree. Go the other way. I'm doing the opposite of what I just did. I'm not going to sin. I'm going to glorify God. And then the second part of that, Ephesians 4.32 says this. Ephesians 4.32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. <laughs> so there's more to it than just confessing our sins. Or resisting the devil, having God forgive me of my sins, then turning away from them, repenting for, and, and, and forsaking them completely. There's something else that, that we need to do as well. Because if we do all of that and yet don't do what Ephesians 4.32 says to do, we've missed the mark. What are we supposed to do? Jane says, be kind and compassionate to others and forgive them. Rosalind, be kind and forgiving. Yes, we have to also forgive others. If we're not willing to forgive others, what's God say about us? Where's the love? 
right? If God forgave us so much, there's a parallel about this in the New Testament. For God has forgiven us of so much and we are sinned against in such a little way and we're unwilling to forgive that person? Oof. Ephesians 4 says we are commanded to. Sonia says, forgive those who hurt us and show them grace as we have received from Christ. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. Hey, do I need to stop, Brett, or can I keep going? No, I'm good. I keep going. Okay, a couple more minutes. I think we have, what do we have, Andy? Two more questions? We have number 16? Yes, number 16. Okay. We're going to look. We'll try to get through these two here real quick. We're going to read John 13, 5 to 10, and we're going to answer this question. Uh, what basic Christian grace is Jesus both teaching and modeling in this passage? So John 13, 5 to 10 says this. Then he poured out water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand thereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And if you are clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. So what are we seeing? And really in verses 5 to 7 are where we're focusing here. What, what, what is Jesus modeling in verses 5 to 7? It's just one word. What's he modeling? Rosalind got it. Exactly. She's the first one to pipe in. Uh, you win the prize. <laughs> she says humility. Sorry, Rosalind, there's no prizes. No. Service. Yes. Jane, exactly. It is service. Service from a position of humility. In fact, the most grossest of all the service you could have is washing someone's feet in the Old Testament or New Testament times. They were disgusting. Those open-toed sandals, oof, that would be nasty. But Jesus was humble. I mean, that's, a, a, that, that's what he's modeling right here. And beyond his teaching on this Christian grace of humility, what else was Jesus teaching by his reference to washing? So in verse 8, Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him and said, if, you, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. What's Jesus saying there? Yeah, Sonia, that's right. Humbleness, exactly. Okay, Rosalind says we are, we are cleansed from sin. That's right. That's exactly right. We, we have the need for him, and we can show that answer, Andy, for the sake of time. Uh, yeah, right, Gilbert, you're not my disciple. He says, man, you're not my... We have to have him clean us from our sin in order to be part of his family. You're not going to Jesus clean. You come to Jesus dirty, he cleans you, and you are whole. You are clean. Once and for all, part of his family. But then there's further, right? There's further in verses, in verses 9 to 10. His reference to bathing the whole body in verses 9 to 10, that, that says that we need this complete cleansing from sin at conversion. That's, that's, that's what he's showing us is in verses 9 and 10, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said, he who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Jesus here is talking about a complete cleansing from sin at conversion. And the big theological term, see, okay, we'll get complex here for just a second. The big theological term here is called definite sanctification. We are made holy, pure, clean, once for all. Definitely sanctified. We are set apart as children of God. And finally, the reference to his washing the feet alone in that, uh, in these verses, that refers to a daily cleansing from sin. And so we use the big theological term there. One of my favorites, anyone who knows has been around uh, when I've been teaching, uh, if I had a whiteboard, I would draw out the curve. It's called progressive sanctification. 
And so we're becoming more and more like Christ every day. But we rise to become more like Christ, and then we fall and we're tempted by our lusts and the sin. And then we repent, and then we rise to become more like Christ, and then we're tempted again. And it goes on and on until finally we start here, we end up here, and we're glorified. Another big theological term. We're, we are we're made whole, whole, finally, in God's glory. But imperfect, but not perfect not like God. We aren't made God. So it's a big step between our perfection and God's perfection. So uh, we're going to end here with uh, one, last, one last question, and I want you to, to be challenged by this. In 1 Peter 2, 2 and Acts 20, verse 32, God wants us as newborn Christians. If you're a newborn Christian and you're watching this, and this is the first time you're hearing this, go back and look at these verses. Follow up when we're done. We're going we're gonna to close in prayer here in just about two minutes. Uh, we need to be built up. That means edified, means made strong or strengthened. How do we do it? By feeding on his word, by feeding on the Bible every day. Just like getting up. You guys don't skip breakfast. I don't skip breakfast. I don't skip lunch. I don't skip dinner either. But, but well, I don't skip a meal, okay? Uh, and, and through this pandemic, it's, you can't see it because I'm thankfully hidden by the pulpit, but it's starting to show. We need to feed on God's word every day. It needs to show. It needs to show that we're feeding on his word. And it will show. Remember, there's no hidden Christians. People are going to see the difference. Um, so that we may grow to be more like Christ. That's the, that's the idea. We grow to be more like Christ. Okay, so uh, I, want to re I want to end by reading this uh, little quip they have here at the end. Uh, A.B. Simpson, in his daily devotional book entitled Days of Heaven on Earth, tells us about a mother who found her small boy standing beside a tall sunflower with his feet stuck in the mud. When she asked, what in the world are you doing there? He naively answered, mom, I'm trying to grow to be a man. His mother laughed heartily at the idea. Then patting him gently on the head, she said, why, Harry, that's not the way to grow. You can never grow bigger by trying. Just come right in, eat enough food, have plenty of exercise, and you'll grow to be a man without trying so hard. So in the following lessons that we're going to do, we're going to give you that opportunity uh, to grow and uh, to be involved in those spiritual exercises that we uh, suggest, that God's Word suggests. And uh, that way we can become a, a mature, um, really a, a fruitful, and we will get into that later, but a fruitful member of God's family. So uh, we're going to end there. I think we've, uh, we've reached our, our allotted time. And uh, I know there's no choir practice because... Uh, well, I'm here and nobody else is, so I don't think the choir will be here tonight. So do I have the grace to go over? <laughs> Am I going to get in trouble? No, no, we're done. We're going we're gonna to end with this. Thank you all for uh, hopping on our YouTube video tonight. And uh, for those uh, that are in the back, uh, thank you, Andy and, and Dave and Brett. We appreciate you guys being here and making all of this um, magic of, of electrons happen. So I uh, appreciate you guys. And so we'll close in prayer. Be sure, guys, uh, to tune in each and every week on our YouTube channel for our worship service. Uh, I know uh, Pastor uh, uh, Ben's going to be back this week uh, preaching to us. So, uh, And then Pastor Don will be back uh, from his vacation, his much-earned, much-deserved vacation uh, the week after that uh, for next week. So uh, let's close in a word of prayer, and, uh, and you guys have a blessed evening. Let's pray. Almighty God, we just uh, we thank you so much, Lord, that uh, we know you, we love you. Uh, we thank you for that relationship that we have with you, Lord, and uh, it's just a blessing. We just we pray for those, Lord, that are apart from you. We pray that you would draw them into you. Uh, use us, Lord. Use us to to go out and be that salt and light that you've called us to be. Help us to be obedient, uh, to move in a way, Lord, that would honor and glorify you, and give us the power through your Holy Spirit to carry the gospel to each and every person you've appointed us to do in the manner you'd have us to do it. Lord, help us to be faithful servants and witnesses to you, to banking disciples of all the nations. And uh, we ask for your blessing on this evening and the safe return uh, to worship together on Sunday. And Lord, uh, we just praise you and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed week, everyone.